the meeting at 146. And uh, would you like to conduct the roll? Uh, Director Jim Brown? He's muted. Um, I'm trying to unmute him. Yeah, Rex is muted also. I'm sorry, okay. I think lots of members muted. Of, I think two of us keep hitting the mute and unmute button. <laughs> okay. Director Brown, you're unmuted now. Here. Director Larry Stransky? Yes. Director Richie Wasserman? Muted. He's muted. Okay. He, he is now unmuted. Okay, I'm here. Thank you. Uh, Director Alvin Smith? Here. Director John Haschak? He, he said here. Here. Uh, uh, Director Rex Jackman? I don't know which number is his. I'm going to assume that it's this one. It's just you, that Rex? I'm unmuted. Great. Yeah. Yeah. I think if you just leave everyone unmuted, we can mute ourselves. Mm -hmm. Uh, Vice Chair Michael Carter. Here. And Chair Dan Jurdy. Here. Thank you. Okay. Uh, now we're going to convene as the Regional Transportation Planning Agency, recess as the Regional Transportation Planning Agency, and reconvene as the Policy Advisory Committee. Uh, first time on our agenda is public expression. Uh, do we have any uh, members of the public who would like to address the Mencio Council of Government? I'm going to check the web email one more time, and if Danielle will check the uh, the other email. There is no website email. And we have not received anything in advance either. Um, I can unmute the room to see if we have anybody for public comment. Okay, I don't have any public comment at this time. Okay, then we'll go on to item number five, regular calendar presentation and acceptance of the MCOG Triennial Performance Audit by Michael Baker International. Okay, well, let me just start off by saying that uh, this is a required um, triennial audit. So every three years, uh, the Transportation Development Act uh, says that we need to have this audit done on both um, MCOG and on MTA. So we have procured once again, Mr. Derek Wong, who's with us today uh, from Micro Michael Baker International. And he's an expert on these matters and uh, we're lucky to have him on this project. So I will let him uh, tell you all about it. And uh, I think there may be some difficulty. Uh, I'll, I'll probably be sharing a screen, uh, a presentation. Okay, so I'm going to do that. So just give me a moment yeah. to share my screen. I will pull that right up. Here we are. And I will go to slideshow. Sorry about that. And here we go. That's great. All right. Well, thank you, Jenny. If everyone can hear me, yeah. Hope everyone can can hear me then. And good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, directors. Um, again, I'm Derek Wong with Michael Baker International. I'm pleased to present um, the findings of the Triennial Performance Audit. That's uh, required by the Transportation Development Act. Um, Janet, you can just move on to the next slide, please. That uh, the, the TDA, um, as all of you may be aware, that it's a major uh, funding source uh, provided here in California, which is the quarter cent uh, sales tax that is um, collected by the state and returned to each county for use primarily uh, for public transportation, um, as well as um, other uses uh, by the COG, as well as um, um, some um, bicycle and pedestrian projects from the local jurisdictions. And so as a condition of uh, receiving these 
funds, the TDA uh, law requires that a performance audit on a triennial basis uh, be conducted of MCOG and MTA as the larger recipients of the funds. And so the, these audits, um, they're commissioned by MCOG and ultimately the reports um, are submitted to Caltrans um, with MCOG serving as the state designated RTPA um, under state law, the Regional Transportation Planning Agency. And um, th this audit um, in general reviews the accountability and efficient uh, use of the revenues that are returned to the county. Go ahead, Janet. So the purpose of, of the audit, um, it's, re it's retrospective in that um, it reviews the latest uh, three year um, cycle period. And so this particular one um, goes back and covers the three year period from fiscal years 15, 16, 16, 17, and 17, 18. Um, and part of our process is that we tested for uh, various uh, compliance with different uh, statutory uh, uh, provisions in the law, as well as uh, reviewed and evaluated different performance measures for each agency. And we view these, these audits as a management tool to improve the future, because uh, unlike a, a financial audit, which, you know, st which strictly looks at numbers and ensures their integrity, um, the performance audit is, you know, as the name implies, that we uh, conduct our site visits, um, look at different performance trends, and um, you know, come up with um, a variety of findings and recommendations to help the agencies uh, move forward. All right, next slide, Janet. So our general scope of the audit, uh, we search to answer these uh, five questions, um, including if the agency has complied with uh, different state requirements, has uh, each agency implemented prior recommendations, um, what are the different performance trends, how well has each agency provided their service that goes into uh, different uh, functional areas? And then at the end, what recommendations can be made? Okay, Janet, next one. So I'll first start with um, the Mendocino, Mendocino Transit Authority MTA audit and just really hit upon the, some of the major um, areas. And so MTA um, in testing for uh, nine different requirements that they were in full compliance with uh, six of the nine and a few of the other um, compliance um, areas that were just partially implemented just relate to the reporting of different uh, measures to the state uh, as well as um, other types of uh, factors. And so um, they, they were in partial compliance with the other three. Regarding the status of um, prior recommendations, there were five that we made um, in the last triennial period. And so one was fully implemented uh, three were carried forward in this audit, so you'll see them as recommendations in a couple of minutes. And then one no longer applied. And the one that no longer applied um, was, uh, um, it addressed about charter bus service policies in the past that uh, MTA no longer um, provides. So that's why um, that prior recommendation no longer is applicable, just due to charter services no longer being, being uh, implemented. In terms of some uh, major areas, um, the fare box recovery ratio is a major TDA uh, ratio. And that ratio, as you may be aware, is the, uh, um, the, the formula of uh, fare revenues plus other um, local support revenues um, divided by um, total operating costs. And so during this period, there was a change in 2016 by state law that reduced uh, MTA's fare box standard. Um, prior to 2016, it was a ratio of about uh, between 14, 15% recovery. And through state law to help relax um, some of the requirements that uh, it was reduced down to 10%, which is primarily the standard ratio for um, urban, I mean, sorry, for rural operators. And so that's a new standard since that uh, MTA um, is required to meet, which it has met during this three year period. Although, uh, you know, with some of the performance measures that we reviewed, including um, increased operating costs and declining ridership that occurred during this period, that MTA was still able to uh, meet this uh, TDA uh, fare box recovery ratio, um, just due uh, mainly because it, it was you know, lowered to that 10% um, level. Uh, also, during this time that, you know, there was, you know, significant change at MTA, um, a new executive director had just come on board and there were many changes that uh, occurred. 
And so that you know did, did disrupt the, the system to some degree internally. Um, there were uh, new operational policies that were uh, updated um, to bring the agency uh, up to date internally. A lot of different uh, processes that were um, improved and so on. So that was part of the um, experience that, that occurred over the last uh, three years. Although, um, as we mentioned, you know, several of the performance measures uh, could continue to, to be met. Okay, next one, Janet. So uh, of, from our findings and review that we um, provided uh, four recommendations, and as I mentioned, three were carried over from the uh, prior audit. And uh, the first one, which is a, a carryover, is about improving upon the consistent reporting of the performance data to the state controller. Um, it's one of the um, major reports that um, is required. And so we recommend that they continue to improve upon the different um, uh, different uh, performance uh, indicators and standards that um, get submitted. The second one to perform an expanded data analysis using um, newly invested technology systems. Um, MTA over the last several years has uh, purchased and is using uh, newer technology software to collect information. And so that, that is a great thing. Um, that is a, um, a growth area in the public transit industry about using uh, new technology systems. And so uh, that that is uh, an additional recommendation is, is for MTA to continue using that to expand the use of um, this uh, great technology to uh, improve their uh, analysis and operations. The third one, uh, which is another carryover, is to update their short range transit development plan. And uh, it's a plan that generally is, is updated every five, six years. And it's been some time that MTA has updated. So um, that is one thing that um, they uh, can do. And I understand that MTA may be undertaking this uh, in-house because they may have that technical ability to, to, do, to do so, um, to look for their future improvements to their service. Now, last uh, bullet, uh, consider an alternate funding formula for senior center funds that um, it's uh, one that's been carried over for a couple cycles. And it does uh, relate to um, what I'll discuss in a little bit um, about the uh, the MCOG audit, so I'll, I'll save that for, for for later. Okay, can we move on to the next one, Janet? Okay, quickly onto the MCOG audit that uh, the COG had fully complied with uh, twelve different requirements in the TDA statute. And one thing that I did want to point out is that the, the Transit Productivity Committee, which is one of the committees uh, uh, within the COG, that it has significantly improved its review um, as a requirement of TDA is to review the performance of MTA um, over time. And so during this period, um, MCOG had uh, developed um, transit standards to do and, and perform an ongoing um, analysis and review of MTA. So that, that's a great thing as uh, part of the TDA um, statute for the COG to uh, conduct an ongoing analysis of MTA. In regards to uh, prior performance audit recommendations, uh, two of them were implemented and uh, one is still in progress. And that, that also pertains to um, the alternate funding formula for the senior center um, funding, which I'll um, explain a little bit in our, in our uh, recommendations. Part of this audit period, the last uh, three years that um, a new executive uh, director, uh, Nafili, was um, hired back in uh, June of 2018. And so she brings uh, her own a uh, mix of, of talent and uh, different ways of, of, uh, of administering the agency. And so it's nice to have a, a fresh start as well. And um, you know, part of her responsibility um, is developing uh, you know, new relationships, building partnerships to, to excel um, and enhance uh, MCOG's um, abilities. Another uh, re responsibility is during this time period, the Regional Transportation Plan, which is a requirement um, of RTPA that was approved and adopted back in February 2018. Uh, there were a lot of other partnerships that were developed by MCOG uh, for zero, zero emission and um, gas, uh, greenhouse gas reduction um, studies and strategies that were developed. And so that was a, a good thing to, to find as well. Okay, next slide. So we get to uh, the two recommendations for uh, MCOG 
Um, the first one regarding um, considering the alternate funding formula for the senior center funds. There's been a review over you know, the past several years about the role of the senior centers, uh, the transportation program, MTA's programs, and the use of TDA funds. And so MCOG and the TPC and MTA have been uh, working for a number of years to, to the, um, hold discussions about um, you know, re reviewing and relooking at the funding formulas um, regarding the senior center transportation and the programs that they provide. So I understand that a uh, working group um, has been um, um, assembled and you know, they're, they're continuing some workshops and discussion on that. So it's, it's good to see that um, this recommendation is still in progress of being implemented, but there are um, actions that are being taken by both MCOG, MTA and the senior centers. The second and final recommendation uh, about confirming alignment of MCOG personnel roles and, and responsibilities, that this uh, carries forward from uh, a few years ago when um, the MCOG was subject to uh, a Caltrans review and um, you know, the administrative function of MCOG was, was redistributed, we'll say. And so you know, during this time period, the last three years that MCOG has had a chance to um, um, to, to settle down of some sorts uh, with their new um, you know, management and their um, new procedures and, and processes. And so moving forward, that um, the agency has an opportunity now that things have settled down somewhat um, to just confirm that you know, its duties and, and responsibilities and roles of staff um, you know, do align with um, the growing, ever growing responsibilities of the RTPA which you know, do include things regarding housing, transportation, transit, uh, as we saw greenhouse, greenhouse uh, gas emissions and so forth. So there's a, a growing list um, of responsibilities and this is just to help um, you know, for MCOG to, to confirm its alignment through its uh, you know, ongoing review over the next uh, several year period. So that concludes just my, my brief presentation. I apologize if I went over, but uh, I'd be happy to answer questions you may have. Thank you. I think I'll take this screen down for now. Um, the board packet included uh, the full uh, reports, both audit reports. So you have that and um, my staff report. So if anyone has questions or discussion, I can pull up any of those items and share them on the screen. And if not, what we're asking for is um, just acceptance of both of these audits and accepting the presentations. Oh, I just like to say, you know, I talked to um, Richard Baker of the uh, Willett Senior Center this afternoon. And, um, you know, he says that they're looking at this alternative funding mechanism or uh, whatever it was called, you know. And um, so he says they've been working on it and he's feeling positive that up with something in the near future. So. So with that, I'll move from acceptance of the. I have a question. Audit I have a question. Can we wait a second? Uh, what, uh, what did you, do you have something in mind for alternative funding for uh, the senior center transportation? So um, we actually have um, under, let's see, where did we end up putting that on the agenda, Janet? So we do have a, a report yeah. on this agenda to um, provide a little more information on the progress that we've made on that so far. It is. It's in the budget uh, section. Okay. Kind of the last the, thing. It's sort of indirectly related. So yes. Kind okay. Of grouped so it up. No. after the um, transit productivity committee recommendations, we'll have a report on the um, senior center transportation workshops and progress on that um, alternative funding formula. Good. <laughs> I second uh, the motion. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing, do we have any public comment on this item? Sure. 
Richard Baker. Uh, can you just confirm that no one is muted? Can I be Richard. heard, Richard Baker, Willett Senior Center? Go ahead, Richard. Y yes, go ahead. Okay, I didn't know if anybody could hear me because nobody- We can hear me. you, yeah. Yes, um, I spoke with John today. I think we've made a lot of progress. Uh, we've been talking to Nafili and MTA and Janet, and it's nothing definitive, but we, we we're starting to establish some perimeters, uh, performance standards that uh, we think uh, obviously need to be in place and um, we're pleased with the progress and looking forward to working on that so we can make sure that we're uh, complying with what the requirements are. Do we have any other public comment? Nothing on the email. Unless uh, okay, Danielle then can we is have seeing a... anything. Oh, sorry. I also do can not we then have... have any email. I'm sorry. Can we then have a roll call vote? Director Brown? Okay. Oh, he's on mute. I, I keep <laughs> unmuting him, and he keeps getting re-muted. I'm sorry. Oh. I don't know if he has muted himself or if someone. Okay. It's the director Brown. Maybe just raise your hand if you agree. Sorry, I keep hitting unmute. Thank you. Thank you, director Brown. Okay. Oh. Okay. Now, now so that's a uh, yes from director Brown. Okay. Uh, Director Stransky? Yes. Director Wasserman? What I can do is yes. out what I have. Uh, Director Alvin? People donations, and then if you see any. Hi, yes. Uh, Director Hashtag? Yes. Uh, Director Jackson? Yes. Uh, Vice Chair Carter? Yes. Chair Dirty? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Now we'll go on to the next item, which is the um, uh, fiscal year 2020-21 RTA budget presentation and workshop. Yes, I'll take that one. Uh, so today, uh, because of the teleconference, um, I thought I'd spare you the full-on lecture that I've always got at the ready. Um, I, I went ahead and sent out the slides in advance, so you've had a chance to look at those. They're up on the website. Um, hopefully I caught the last few typos on the web posting. Um, so what I thought I would do is just um, do the first few slides. I'd just like to point out the, the major highlights of the budget and then open it up to discussion and questions. And uh, some of the other staff might also have remarks. So if you give me just a moment, I'm going to bring up my um, budget presentation. And oh dear, it looks like I have to, uh, sorry for the delay here, um, get into my PowerPoint and bring up the other one. Here it is. Ah, okay. There we go. Now, sorry, we're just kind of getting the hang of <laughs> hang of this, and I'm looking for that screen, and it should be this one. Wrong one. See, I, I'm sorry. I had everything um, loaded and at the ready, so I think I'll close that one and apologize for the delay here. That one's going away, and this one's going away, and hopefully that leaves the correct presentation. One more try. Share screen. Here we are. First time I've done this. So 
<laughs> now I'll just start that slideshow. Here we go. Now, now we're ready. Okay. So just my front cover with the latest uh, picture of the rail trail that I took in January. Now, um, the main thing here is it's a very unusual budget year. There are many unknowns. As you all know, you're going through it with your own council, city council, board of supervisors. Um, so this is just a caveat that, that we're looking at pretty early estimates. And we expect these to change because of the, the pandemic, the, the impact on the economy. So we'll be coming back to you with um, revisions to consider later on when we have some actual. So um, you, you've got my written staff report um, in the board packet that covers a lot of details, details of budget steps that we've taken to date with the committee's meeting and having a look at all this one by one and the main issues that are emerging. So uh, just briefly, um, these are the uh, local state and federal funds that we have of various types. And uh, I'll just point out um, that the, what we for many years called the RSTP, Regional Surface Transportation Program is now called Surface Transportation Block Grant Program. And I'm, I'm working on correcting um, these instances throughout the budget materials. And uh, we also have um, a report from the planning staff on the planning program that's in your packet as well. we'll be able to talk about the planning funds. So uh, that's just an overview. Um, and in your packet, you've got this uh, one page um, spreadsheet. It's a summary. It doesn't have the color tints. I'm just trying to show you where the different funding types are. And you also have this three page detailed format that compares to last year and has some notes in it for each of the lines. And you've got the explanatory notes on the funding sources also in your agenda packet. So this is, um, I'm going to stop at this slide here for now and um, just go over the main issues. So the normal sales tax revenue we were getting in uh, to the local transportation fund, that's our quarter cent transportation dedicated sales tax, was starting to approach $4 million um, in the last year or so. And uh, the estimate that is required by the county auditor was made in late January before all this uh, hit with the, the COVID virus. So he was at that time um, seeing continued growth and we were really having a, a, a continued uh, up curve there. And it was gonna get over $4 million. And now we don't expect that to happen. So um, our draft budget proposal suggests not allocating any of the projected increase, but to sort of set that aside and, and uh, pretend that we're, we have last year's estimate for now. So um, we also might see um, uh, the state transit assistance funding go down um, this year, starting in this fiscal year, probably even um, and into the next year, because that comes from gasoline taxes primarily. So uh, having talked to the county auditor, um, we understand that he will be uh, reporting to the board of supervisors and uh, wants to wait till we see the first few months of actuals before he revises his estimate officially. But he is meeting very regularly with a sales tax consultant. They're keeping a close eye on this. And uh, in due course, we'll get uh, a revised estimate. So um, that's kind of on the downside. Typically, our budget has been with all the funding sources uh, around $8 million. And now we have um, two um, new factors that are driving that up to about 12 million as things stand now until more actuals are known. So the first of those is the, um, the CARES Act that Congress passed has a big package for transit, um, public transit relief for public transit operators. And um, they've released 30% um, of that in this current fiscal year, 2019-20. And the rest is supposed to come in 20, 
2020-21. This is the budget year we're looking at here. And we are not sure yet um, how that will roll out. We know it's coming through the Federal Transit Administration's um, Section 5311 program, as it's called. Um, it's unclear right now whether that is will just be on a reimbursable basis for actual costs documented, losses that are documented, or whether there'll be some kind of uh, formula or um, formula method of disbursement or something like that. Uh, it seems like the first um, round in this current year that MTA just submitted was more of a reimbursable basis where they had to actually uh, document their losses. So we'll see how that rolls out. Um, there's a lot of money there and it's, it's meant to um, backfill uh, losses from our other funding, local funding sources. And the other item is a big one. Um, it's coming time, pretty close to time for construction on the uh, Covalo Trail project on the one uh, State Route uh, 162 corridor in Round Valley. And that's that project's been underway for quite a while. Um, it has gone through um, environmental and uh, design and uh, right of way stages. Some of those are still happening. And uh, the next step is the construction. And um, don't know whether that'll be on time or not, but um, if things go as planned, um, this coming uh, fiscal year would be when those uh, already granted funds will be um, allocated by the California Transportation Commission. So depending on project readiness, um, we'll see that. And that's um, a 2.86 million dollars and that really drives up our, our budget numbers. Um, I have one other thing um, that's not on this slide but um, I've talked about it in my staff report that uh, before we knew about this uh, federal funding relief uh, for transit um, we were looking for some areas maybe we could trim back and one of those is the optional uh, two percent of the local transportation fund for bike and pedestrian projects and so in the draft proposal that you see there on the spreadsheet um, that's uh, set at zero instead of about 73 or 74 million i mean thousand dollars 73,000 is what it would have been uh, but I'd like your input on that and see um, how the board feels about that, if that's something we ought to hang on to, or whether um, we can let go of that for this year, or maybe just wait and see how these revenues come in. So um, that's about what I've got here. Um, I thought maybe we'd also talk a little about um, the next steps, how to um, conduct these revisions. Maybe we um, could involve the executive committee to help guide staff as, as we go forward. So uh, that's as far as I was going to go into my slide deck here. Um, you've got um, a copy of that. So if there's anything you wanna uh, dig into, I can bring up those slides or we can just uh, answer questions or whatever you wanna do now. So I'm gonna close this now. So I'll stop my screen share. And now we can see each other again. So I, I want to add a comment on the two uh, percent, the LTF two percent bike and ped funding. Um, when we talked about that, you know, we knew that there were going to be these unknowns and definitely shortfalls in LTF, which may be made up in other areas. Um, but we felt like that was. Um, a logical thing to cut out. One of the um, one of the biggest factors in that is that we don't have, you know, it's not already dedicated towards something. There's nobody that is depending on that funding at this point in time. So it was an easy thing to this year's budget without impacting um, anything that's already in the works. Yeah, I, I think um, MT appreciated that gesture. We'll see whether that's needed. Anything stand out for anybody that um, you'd like to get into anymore?
And uh, I guess what we'll have to do um, in June, uh, June 1st, we're, we're meant to uh, adopt a budget. And, um, you know, we prepare all these resolutions and findings and put all that together. Uh, I'm going to plan on doing that. And, you know, we need to have a budget. Um, so you'll get all that. Um, if we learn anything new in the next month, um, I'll try to work that in and maybe um, if there's any question about that, maybe um, call on the executive committee to look at that with us. And otherwise I'm just gonna bring pretty much what you see here to the, the June budget table and just expect that um, a few months down the line, we're gonna have to uh, fine tune this thing. I, I think the uh, auditor really wanted to wait for the first quarter of actual. So, um, you know, these are two months behind, um, you know, when the sales tax is collected to when we receive it is a lag of two months. So, um, yeah, one of the other things you see in my packet is how are we doing for the current fiscal year and what's come in so far. And um, I've got that in the slides as well. Uh, that brought us up through um, receipts that came in in April, which were for February, were collected in February. So that was really kind of while people were still shopping and traveling and, and all of that. So at that point, uh, we were about 6% ahead of budget, uh, you know, excess a little bit over the budget for that point uh, in the year. And we still need to pull in about a million dollars. Um, don't know if we'll see a shortage or not, but um, we will be watching how the revenues come in. And, and maybe that'll, uh, the, the revenues for this current year might be a better indication of what's coming up as well. So we have that. Is, is there any harm in waiting to make a decision on the bicycle and pedestrian? I don't think so. And um, usually we um, accumulate a couple of years of that funding before we go out and ask the uh, technical advisory committee for project proposals. So um, I'm trying to remember where we are in that cycle. If we just have already allocated what was in, in the uh, fund balance, Loretta we, might remember that. Yeah, we did make some um, recent awards of that funding source. Okay. Um, if we were to wait on that decision, of course, um, the board's not taking action today. That'll be mm -hmm. at the June board meeting. Um, but we would need to, if there's, um, if there's a feeling that we may not want to, uh, we may want to hold back on releasing those funds. Uh, we probably would want to put them in some sort of a temporary reserve uh, because otherwise they would be released for transit. So um, I think we would need to do, if there's a feeling that we would want to still continue funding that in this budget year, we, we need to set them aside somehow for um, action at a later time. Uh, I also wanted to mention that in in the statewide meetings that we participate in, the Rural Counties Task Force, um, the statewide RTPA group, and the CalCog directors, everybody is going through the same budget process currently. Some um, actually their budget process starts earlier and they're further into it. And what most people are doing is uh, adopting, you know, somewhat conservative budgets, but mm -hmm. using the estimates that they had prior to the COVID crisis, because mm -hmm. that's the data that is available. Everybody knows that they'll have to make amendments, but at the same time, they have to adopt a budget based on some, some kind of numbers. So um, I think that RTBAs around the state will be going through budget amendment processes uh, later in the fiscal year. And that was pretty much the advice from the county auditor for now. It just kind of be conservative, use kind of the regular level of funding for the moment. 
and we we just kind of agreed on not planning to allocate any projected increase because it's probably going to go the other way. So if um, we don't have anyone who's relying on the bike and pedestrian funds, except the what Nafili said about a few people, you know, some of it was already committed, right? Uh, the funding that was already awarded from that program was from previous years. So this um, fiscal year uh, 2021, none of that money would have been awarded yet. Okay. And then if we normally rely on that 4.1 million sales tax and, and if it goes down 25%, then we're talking about 3 million. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. that's a big hit. <laughs> Pardon? Um, yeah, last year's estimate was three point eight million. The the current year we're in right now, but yeah, if it went down twenty five percent, that would be a huge huge hit. Right. Yeah. So, but we did get the one point two million from CARES, or we will be getting. Yes. Right. Go ahead and feel it. Sure. You might have heard more about it. So that's um. The largest claimant of the LTF funding is, of course, MTA. Mm -hmm. um, so the CARES Act is, has provided funding, um, and like Janet explained, we don't know exactly how that's going to come down, um, but we know that we know the amount or an estimate of the amount that will be available for transit. Um, what makes it a little tricky in the budgeting process is, you know, it's a backfill of funding, but it's coming from a different source. So typically, you know, we're, we're going to see a big drop in LTF. We've already decreased that in our budget somewhat by uh, using last year's estimate rather than this current year's. Um, but we know that it will probably drop further as well as STA. However, the additional funding, the relief funding for transit is coming through a different source. It's coming through the federal 5311 program. Um, so I hope that we wouldn't see, although there might be a significant drop in LTF overall in the big picture, as far as our revenues are concerned, the revenues that go to transit in particular, we wouldn't necessarily have that large of a um, shortfall in our overall revenues. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, sounds like we're kind of on the same page here. Um, you've got my information, a lot of details there, and I'll, I'll bring this back next month. And if anything uh, changes in the meanwhile, we'll keep you informed. But I, I expect that the June budget would look much like this one, the final budget for adoption next month. Uh, let's see. Um, the other things that I listed on the agenda, they're kind of all covered in here. I talked about the report of revenues fiscal year to date. Uh, the executive committee recommendations are pretty much um, in this, what I already presented, um, we've got the planning work program. Loretta, did you want to say anything about the um, transportation planning program proposal? Uh, I believe you have a staff report from the Sealy. Yeah. Uh, or Lexi, I think. Um, yes, I believe you have a staff report from Lexi on the yeah, in your board packet. Right. Yeah. So that's there. And in the slide deck, there's a little summary, one slide that kind of lists all the projects. And there is a little bit of project reserve in that, around $11,000, $12,000, that um, if necessary, we can um, make use of that. Uh, the, the last committee that met was the, the Transit Productivity Committee. And that's when we were becoming aware of, just becoming aware of the CARES Act uh, relief funds. So that's when we kind of 
tweak things a little bit on this um, proposed budget. And we got MTA's claim in. So they also uh, don't quite know how to proceed. Uh, we're just going, they, they went with last year's claim numbers pretty much as far as the local transportation funds. So they're claiming the same amount as last year for that. And then the final thing on this uh, budget agenda today is the report of the Senior Center's Transportation Program workshops that we held. Uh, we had one in September and one in March uh, with good attendance by the Senior Center directors. Nifili, would you like to talk about that? Yes. So um, we started, as, as you heard in the um, presentation of the audits, we've had this recommendation to revise the senior center funding formula. Um, we started that process at the Transit Productivity Committee last year, um, and it became clear that we needed to um, develop some consistency in data collection and reporting among the senior center transportation programs. So we held um, our first senior center transportation workshop uh, last fall, and that provided a venue for the directors of those uh, five senior centers. So it's Ukiah, Willits, Anderson Valley, uh, Redwood Coast, which is the Fort Bragg Senior Center, and Coastal Seniors, which serves the South Coast area. Um, they came together and discussed the uh, their programs, and we worked with them and with MTA to um, agree on consistent methods for reporting that were consistent with the uh, TDA, uh, which provides definitions and uh, requirements for uh, data collection and um, reporting of costs and, and uh, revenues. Um, we then had another workshop earlier this year prior to the Transit Productivity Committee meeting. Um, at that workshop, we reviewed the data that had been collected then using the consistent methods that had been agreed upon. Um, and the workshop also provided an opportunity for the senior center directors to discuss um, with their representative on the TPC, anything that they uh, wanted to move forward to the TPC. Um, so following that meeting, so the, I should add the representatives um, on the TPC uh, were at that time, Diana Clark of the Ukiah Senior Center uh, with Richard Baker of the Willett Senior Center mm -hmm. as alternate. Um, since that time, since that time, uh, Diana has retired and Richard is has now taken place as the um, primary appointee on the Transit Productivity Committee and we have a new alternate. Um, so following uh, the- yeah, it's Jill at Redwood Coast, is that right? Yes, Jill is the new alternate. Jill Rex Road. Okay. Um, following the Senior Center Workshop, uh, Diana and Richard um, worked together to come up with some options that they thought would be appropriate for an alternative funding source. Now, the auditor has suggested that we could consider a funding source based partially on um, on performance and then partially on uh, factors to, to be to be determined by MCOG. So um, the potential formulas that um, the senior center representatives um, came up with looked were divided 75% and 25%, 75% based on um, operating operating data such as um, total riders, total mileage, uh, total cost, and operating hours, and then partially based on other factors. Um, 
which one of the one of the things considered was how well the various senior center services um, were performing in comparison to the MCOG performance standards. Um, MCOG staff also developed some alternate funding scenarios to consider. Um, those were all presented to the TPC at their last meeting and um, there was some good discussion, uh, but ultimately the TPC decided that because it was a complex issue and mm -hmm. comparing a lot of different formulas was somewhat difficult when we were all um, on the phone that we would um, continue that item to a time when we could meet in person again. Um, there was consensus though that any implementation of a revised formula wouldn't begin until um, the 21-22 fiscal year. So not this upcoming fiscal year, but the following one to allow time um, to come up with a new formula, but then also because a revised formula could potentially result in some seniors um, funding, total funding, decreasing allows time for um, possibly phasing in any changes so that it doesn't greatly impact any one senior center. Um, so we, we think that the senior center transportation workshops will be a, an ongoing thing. We'll probably hold those annually. Um, as I said, it provides an opportunity for them to work with their TPC representative and also come together and discuss um, shared issues with senior transportation. So those have been very productive. Um, and I think that we have made, although we haven't finished revising the formula, we've made a lot of really good progress on that. It is a difficult issue and it has been, um, hasn't changed since 1997. So. I'm happy to answer any questions on that. And I also want to mention um, Alexis Pedrati is back uh, in the meeting if there were any questions on the last report um, on the uh, planning work program. John's on mute. <laughs> yeah, I think, I believe that you all have the ability to un self mute and unmute, hopefully. Well, it wasn't. But there you go. <laughs> my question is, so with the senior funding and this alternative funding um, proposal, or would it would be taking the same amount of money and splitting it differently between the senior centers? Is that what mm -hmm. basically being looked at? So that's what is that's what the current discussion um, is about. So of the LTF funding that goes to MTA, 15% of that is divided among the senior centers. Um, so there has been discussion that maybe that total 15% isn't appropriate. Um, the senior centers have suggested that. However, we haven't done any analysis on that particular point yet. So that's something that the TPC could discuss in the future, but it has not uh, has not been discussed so far. Okay, so that would expand the pie that they're dealing with if that number were to go up, that's 15. Correct. But it would it would also reduce then what's available for MTA. So right. I think it's something we would need to um, look at closely, uh, look at ridership data um, system wide. So we are not, we have not been prepared to discuss that so far, um, but it is something that TPC may want to talk about in the future. Okay, thank you. Any of the committee members have anything to add to that? We kind of, um, Sort of truncated our discussion a little. It's just kind of difficult to dig down in all the data and number crunching in a video meeting. So, uh, but anyway, we did have our um, Director Brown, Director Carter was on the Transit Committee. 
and uh, we had two MTA board members and this uh, senior center representative. So, it, you know, it's a good uh, mix of stakeholders. Everybody attended that last meeting. And we got about as far as we could go with it right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, do we have any public comment on this item? There's a mic raising his hand up there. Did Director Carter have something? Uh, I'll okay. check the email once more. Janet, this is Diana Clark. Be, would it be Hello? possible to be included in those meetings in the future? In oh. um, the TPC meetings or the Senior Center Transportation Workshops? The Senior Center Transportation Workshops. If to open the well, I, right now. it's not a Brown Act meeting. Um, it's not elected people. So uh, we did not have a public meeting this, this time, but um, Bailey, what do you think? Well, I, th I think that they certainly could be open to the public. They are not subject to Brown Act requirements, but that doesn't mean that we couldn't open them to the public. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we can. Um, just like we can, to be included. Sure, we can. Um, Perfect. send notifications to board members when those are taking place. I imagine they'll Thank probably you. be, probably be uh, late winter, early spring when those happen. Okay, that's all I have. All right, and it, it sounded like um, Diana Clark is on the phone and wanted to comment. Hi, Nafili, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much, um, Chairman Jurdy and members of the MCOG board. I just wanted to say uh, briefly that um, this was a collaborative effort of all of the senior center directors um, and uh, MTA and um, MCOG staff putting together this alternative uh, formula approach since it had not been addressed since 1997. But the caveat to the draft report that we submitted indicated that we also needed to visit in tandem the overall funding um, for the senior center programs because that also had not been looked at since 1997. And many of the programs had sustained uh, differences such as uh, South Coast now has two more buses than it had two years ago, but yet has not had an increase in its TDA funding. And also in the past, the senior centers had been a able to avail themselves of some of the STA funds, uh, but in recent years, uh, any STA monies made available had gone entirely to MTA. So in light of the fact that the senior centers have um, tried to stay within the 15% budgets, it's important to note that in the past several years, uh, MTA has been able to uh, increase uh, salaries and benefits for its drivers. Um, I think Carla mentioned at the last meeting, 10% uh, increased when she first came on board. And then the most recent union contract had in, uh, increases of 3.5% uh, for two or three years in a row. Whereas our senior center drivers drive at minimum wage. And um, you know we've been trying to get by as well as we can. Uh, but in terms of overall uh, fairness, uh, we think that the funding formula also uh, needs to be looked at in terms of the overall funding necessary uh, for the senior center programs so that they don't diminish in quality uh, because they basically had their funding starved to death. Thank you very much. Thank you, Diana. Do we have any other public comment on this item? Nothing on the email. I also do not have any email comment. Okay, so we'll be, for those of you that are on the TPC, you can expect to hear from us once we're out of um, shelter in place requirements and we'll be scheduling another uh, meeting to work on a revised formula and we'll report back to the board on the progress that's made on that.
Okay, well that. I... So no action is expected today on the budget. It's just a workshop and discussion. So. Um, okay, well thanks. That that then brings us to our consent calendar, which is the minutes of April 6th and approval of the April 13th, uh, 2020 transit productivity committee minutes. Do we have a motion to approve the consent calendar? I will move that we approve the consent calendar. Second. And of course, that's got the minutes of that transit committee meeting we just talked about and the April board minutes. So. Okay, so I think we need to have a roll call for the vote on the consent calendar. Director Brown? Yes. Uh, Director Stransky? Yes. Director Washington? You have Director Washerman. Can you hear you? Is he unmuted? Do we have him on there? Yeah, I just missed it. He is, he, he is unmuted. Okay. He Did gave we, a thumbs up, though. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, Director Alvin Smith? Yes. Director Hashtag? Yes. Director Jackman? Yes. Vice Chair Carter? Yes. Chair Dirty? Yes. Thank you. That takes us to uh, item number nine, which is to recess as the policy advisory committee and reconvene as the regional transportation planning AC. Do we have a motion to ratify the action of the policy advisory committee? I will so move. Second. Okay. Uh, roll call. Uh, Director Brown? Yes. Director Stransky? Yes. Director Washerman? Yes. Director Albert Smith? Yes. Director Hashtag? Yes. Vice Chair Carter? Yes. And Chair Jurdy? Yes. All right. That takes us to reports. Uh, um, these are no action items. Is there an update uh, from Caltrans? Uh, well, I was thinking uh, with the unpredictability of the uh, the current situation with the COVID thing, um, I will probably circle around with staff and we'll figure out what the best option would be for doing uh, uh, orientation for the our online um, map status portal that, that we have developed. Um, again, my, my hope has been that I that we all be back together and I could just do a, a, a demo, but uh, we'll have, I'll have to talk with the staff about what the different options, what the best way to, to convey that information will be. Um, other than that, uh, I'm open to take any questions. Okay, do any board members have any questions for uh, Rex about District 1 Caltrans project? And I'll, I'll add um, that in a, a recent meeting, um, I learned that all in District 1, so all four counties of District 1, all but two projects that were slated to begin construction um, during this season are still moving forward as planned. So it sounds like um, although the current public health crisis has affected a lot of other things, construction seems to be moving forward as planned. Um, most of the, the construction companies are still working um, at full staffing levels. So uh, that was good to hear. Thank you, Nafili. Mm -hmm. And if oh. I add, 
for your information that the Board of Supervisors wanted signs on the entry points into the county on the major highways. And so we are going to go forward with that. We with Caltrans, they're going to forward the sign that will be put on the you know, 101 and um, the Sonoma border and then the Humboldt border, the Lake border, and also 28 and Highway 1. That says uh, shelter in place, essential travel only. So that's what they're proposing to the governor's office, I guess, is where it needs to go for approval that we can put those signs up at our at our board. You are unmuted, for, uh, Director Wasserman. Thank you. Uh, howdy, Rex. Um, yes, well, uh, there was a very graphic demonstration of the full staffing uh, of Galtrans um, uh, this past week uh, in Point Arena as the very full crew arrived early in the morning um, and began work on paving, grinding and repaving a portion of Main Street. Um, actually worked for two days, did both lanes, a very efficient operation. Um, we were surprised because we hadn't been notified uh, that this was going to happen, but we we're very happy to see it. Um, so we thank you. Uh, I wasn't even aware of that myself. Uh, so I guess good news, bad news, but um, I'm glad to hear it. We were, um, we were told um, by the foreman uh, that, um, that originally they were going to do a similar operation in Manchester um, last week, but for some reason uh, made a change and decided to do the work in Point Arena. And hopefully it wasn't very disruptive and hopefully uh, whatever work was done will be uh, Sort of will complement the future work that's going to take place. That that is exactly true, and uh, and it was not uh, disruptive. And of course, most of the businesses were closed down anyway, so it was a very good time to do so. My my good understanding point. is that um, not only are projects moving forward, but several of them have had accelerated schedules to take advantage of the reduced traffic and closed businesses. Um, some projects also, I don't know if there are any, if this is specific to District 1, but there have been some projects that previously had been planned for night construction only, will now be uh, including construction during the day as well to take advantage of um, the reduced traffic. So I guess we can look for the silver linings wherever we can. Right. Okay, well, um, can we go on to other reports? We uh, Is uh, Carla or someone else there from MTA? Um, I'm going to have to disconnect. I have a, something that came up for 3 o'clock, so I thought I'll take advantage of the silence here. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Rex. Thanks, Rex. Bye-bye. There's no one, no MTA staff are on the call currently. Do MTA um, board members that are on MTA have anything to report? In a way, I think we've covered quite a few things just in the fact that we've talked about uh, the performance audit, et cetera. So I don't know if there's anything really new to add. Um, no, we, I just. It, MTA did, and this may have been reported at our last meeting, um, did eliminate service um, after consultation with the health, health officer between Mendocino and Sonoma counties um, to reduce the likelihood of transmission between the two counties and, um, and the homeless population that often takes the bus uh, and uh, cause they're thought to be the, uh, more likely to get COVID-19 and, and not um, go to a doctor. 
so that service has been suspended, as has most of the service between Fort Bragg, Ukiah, and Willits. That Route 65 has been suspended, and now there's there are some limited runs between uh, South Coast and Ukiah and the, the rest of the coast. Uh, but otherwise, service is localized in, in Fort Bragg, Willits, and Ukiah. I don't know, that may be the biggest news, really, for MTA. Yeah, I, I did hear um, also at the board meeting, it sounds like there have been a lot of um, measures taken by MTA to protect their drivers and make cleaning vehicles, um, putting up barriers to make the, the buses as safe as possible at this time. Yeah, that's true. Uh, Tess, you're on MTA. Do you have anything else you want to add? Okay, then uh, is there any report or update from North Coast Rail Authority? Uh, this is Loretta. The NTRA board is no longer eating, meeting monthly. They're now meeting quarterly. So the next meeting will be on June 8th at the board chambers in Ukiah. So I have nothing new to report. Okay, um, MCOC staff. Uh, thank you, John. <laughs> MCOC staff, we have your um, uh, list of meetings. Is there anything in your miscellaneous report you'd like to uh, go over? Um, nothing to add on the summary of meetings. I do have one miscellaneous item that I wanted to report on. Um, I just wanted to give an update on the, um, the implementation of the JPA amendment that was approved at the last meeting. Um, so as you'll recall, um, MCOG approved the JPA amendment, but that does not take effect until all member agencies ratify the amendment by resolution. So the cities of Fort Bragg and Point Arena have already done so. So thank you board members for um, making those things go through smoothly. Um, the city of Ukiah has the item agendized for this week's uh, city council agenda. Um, I understand that um, Chair Jurdy is working uh, with the clerk of the board on getting that on the board of supervisors agenda. And then uh, Janet, do you have any update on um, city of Willits and if they've got that planned for an agenda yet? You're on, Janet, you're on mute. Um. <clears throat> Uh, not to my knowledge, I don't think it's on an agenda yet. I haven't uh, had a confirmation okay. from them. Okay, thank you. So we'll we'll continue to reach out with them, but actually I, I think it's been pretty good progress. I wasn't expecting the um, member agencies to get those uh, agendized that quickly. So um, I feel like that's moving along well. So that's it, I just wanted to give that update. You know, I might say okay. one thing under uh, the summary of meetings, you'll notice there have been, um, <clears throat> I've been attending some meetings around uh, what's called Cal EVIP. That's the California Electric Vehicle uh, Infrastructure Project or Incentive Project. And we had expected that to open up for applications in October this year but it's been moved up to, uh, looks like July 1st. Um, so if apparently um, our Sonoma Coast uh, as project, as it's called, um, was um, more ready to go than some of the other ones that had some issues. So um, that's gonna be opening up in two months. So um, there's gonna be some marketing around that to get the word out. And we're, we're talking to existing partners and um, so that is a first come first serve program. So anybody out there in, uh, in the business community, public agencies, nonprofits, schools, anybody can uh, apply to have um, electric vehicle chargers um, and get much of it reimbursed if, if they get the funding reserved and get their app in on time. So um, anybody interested can get in touch with me and, and find out more about that. 
So that, that's pretty exciting. Um, you know, our, our plan calls for uh, a lot more electric vehicle chargers countywide. And so uh, this is one of the opportunities that we have to be able to do some of that. So let me know if, if you have questions and want to get in touch. You'll be hearing more about it, so. Okay, thanks. Uh, do we have anything from MCOG planning staff? This is Loretta. I have the two grant staff reports in the packet. Uh, the first one on the fire vulnerability assessment and emergency evacuation plan. Uh, there's not a lot of new information to report since we met last month. MCOG staff has spent a considerable amount of time reviewing the vulnerability assessment and evacuation plan uh, draft reports and providing comments to the consultant and Caltrans staff has done the same. So the consultant is now uh, working on finishing those reports. Um, at this point, um, I believe that we're still on track for the consultant to do a presentation in June, although that still could change. And um, I think as I mentioned before, we had to delay the public forums, which were going to be held in May. So we're holding off on selecting new dates at this time. So that's all I have to report unless you have any questions. Uh, none for me. Um, someone might want to mute their phone <laughs> if they've got a, a, a ringer in the background. Um, are there any other board members have a question for Loretta? Any members of the public would like to ask questions of planning staff? Okay. Are any? I wasn't clear. Was there any miscellaneous items you wanted to cover? Um, not hearing any. Okay, we're on to director reports. Any directors uh, have any anything to report to the whole? Not hearing any. Looks like we will adjourn at 3.04. All right. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for your patience. See you in a month. Nathalie and Janet, can you stand?